Hi, welcome to the next episode of The Pet Factor. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. And this week on our wellness section, uh, we're going to talk about a topic that's kind of very confusing, and it's <laughs> joint supplements in pets. Okay. Um, joint supplements became a thing probably about 25 years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, the first one to come out was Cosequin. The first company was Nutramax. And then nobody knew anything about them, uh, if they were going to be effective or not. So I got some, and I tried them with some of my patients, particularly some dogs with hip dysplasia. And I was amazed when I'm getting callbacks from the clients a few weeks later saying the dogs are doing great. So since then, there's been a lot of different joint supplements that have come out. There's a lot of options you have for joint supplements. Um, So we're going to talk over why we would give them, what they are, uh, and which joint supplements you should avoid. Because there are some that are not very good quality. So the main reason to give them is they do improve the quality of life for pets that have been diagnosed with elbow dysplasia, hip dysplasia, um, luxating patellas I've used it on where the kneecaps are sliding in if they Mm -hmm. got degenerative joint disease from arthritis or an injury like a cruciate tear or something like that. Um, They can actually delay or eliminate the need for surgery, especially hip replacements in dogs with hip dysplasia or FHOs. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, I've used them for recovery from joint surgery because it helps the body replace the joint fluid that's lost during the surgery and help uh, repair any damaged cartilage. Um, They can decrease or eliminate the need for using uh, pain medications, non steroidal anti-inflammatories in dogs with arthritis. Mm. So if your dog's on pain medicine and not on a joint supplement, sometimes just by putting them on a joint supplement, we can actually get the pain medicine off or greatly decrease it. for some dogs that are sensitive to the pain medications, that's important. It helps, yeah. Um, and it basically the restores joint lubrication, uh, the synovial fluid, this slippery stuff that really helps the cartilage slide back and forth. They actually do reduce inflammation in their own right. So like a, an anti-inflammatory medication, they do decrease the inflammation in the joint. And then they help by providing building blocks for the body to rebuild healthy cartilage, healthy joint cartilage. So by having this supplement coming in, the body's trying to repair this damage. It's getting a little bit extra help. Nice. It's like you're trying to build a wall, but you keep running out of bricks. This is getting you more, more bricks, bricks so you can build that wall quicker. So if okay. someone's knocking bricks off your wall and you want to replace them, if you don't have enough bricks to replace them fast enough, this helps you do that. Nice. So there's uh, several different types of supplements that we use. Uh, the biggest, most common one are the glucosamine chondroitin supplements. These mm-hmm. are two different molecules. They work synergistically, so they help each other out. So you can use them independently, but if you use them both together, you get much better results. Um, uh, the product we like a lot, uh, Dasequin adds an yeah. ASU, which is avocado soybean unsulfonifiables, which kind of has another synergistic effect with those supplements. Hmm. Um, and those supplements, they basically work by supporting the, the cartilage matrix and inhibiting cartilage breakdown. So they help the body repair damage and inhibit further damage from occurring. Oh, nice. When you have a bad joint, a elbow dysplasia, a hip dysplasia, or an injury, you've got uh, abnormal mechanics in the joint, you get inflammation, you get wear and tear, and that causes damage. Yeah. So this is just bare, there to help get at the source of the pain rather than treating the pain. Hmm. So whenever you can treat, fix the cause of the pain, that works yeah. better than anything else. MSM is another supplement that's often added to these uh, things. It helps restore collagen production. Uh, collagen is in a lot of connective tissue, so it's used yeah. for other things other than uh, joint things as well. Okay. So it can help repair joints and also can help with tendons and ligament injuries as well. Fish oil is another supplement yeah. that's often used for joints, and it's got other uses, but in mm-hmm. joints it's, it's a anti-inflammatory, so it's going to reduce inflammation in the joints. And we're going to talk a little bit about how you, you test the quality of <laughs> omega-3 fish oils. Um, the... Uh, one that we've been trying a little bit lately is the green lipped muscle supplement, Antenol. Oh, so it's it's rich in the omega-3 fatty acids, like the, the fatty acid supplements has some other things in there. Um, they don't know the exact method how that actually helps with the joints. Yeah. They think that the omega-3s play a role in it, but it seems to help. Um, you can find green lip muscle supplements all over, but again, there's a huge difference in quality. So Antenol yeah. from Behringer Ingelheim is probably one of the better ones out there. And then for dogs that don't like the oral ones or they have allergies, there's an injectable supplement mm-hmm. called Adequin. This is a polysulfated glycosaminoglycan, and they call it a, a disease-modifying osteoarthritis drug. So it works a little bit differently than the other supplements. Um, they've, the studies they've done, they show within two hours of an injection, it's actually getting into the affected joints. Oh, okay. 
and actually incorporates into the cartilage. And they think that it may help protect the cartilage from further damage over time. Mm. And single injection, they've shown it lasts at least three days. So that's why when we initially start it, we'll give injections twice a week for mm-hmm. a few weeks. And if we see some improvement, we can find that you don't need to keep giving it every three days to get the same effect. You can actually go out to even once a month oh, to yes. keep them healthy once, once it's there. So why would people or when would people start giving these supplements? You don't want to just go to the store and buy the supplements because no. your dog's limping. The first thing you want to do is get them to the vet and have them checked out. Because mm-hmm. you want to find out why they're limping, what's causing the problem. It may have nothing to do with their joints. It may be a muscle injury. Yep. Joint supplements are going to help. It may be neurological. Mm-hmm. So it's important that the vet give a full evaluation, neurologic exam, and x-rays so we can see how things look. And if you had x-rays done a year ago, do them again because a lot of things can change yeah. during that time. Well, and then especially younger dogs, too. So right. their growth plates are always changing. So. What looks different now can always look. And it could be the panosteitis that we talked about uh-huh. last week, which case joint supplements aren't going to help with Great. that either. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, uh, the other things that are going to be included in joint supplements, we're not going to just say, hey, here's some joint supplements, your dog's going to get better. No. We're going to probably say you, pro- you may have to lose some weight. Mm-hmm. Overweight dogs are very prone to arthritis. Yep. We may uh, just exercise in general helps support the muscles, and you want to make sure that keeping the move because that movement helps the joints stay healthy. Um, physical therapy, where they actually go for dogs that are having a tough time moving around, they do water treadmills, yes. swimming. Those can be really, really Those helpful are really as good well. For them. Um, and then we may add in some pain medications, especially initially if the dog's in a lot of pain and mm-hmm. gradually wean those off. Or in severe cases, we may end up recommending surgery. Yeah. You know, they may come in with a torn ligament in their knee, and we say, okay, we need to stabilize that. Yes, joint supplements are going to be part of our treatment plan, mm-hmm. but without surgery, they're not going to get much better. Um, the biggest problem I see is. There's really a lot of supplements out there that are yes. junk. Mm-hmm. I'd say majority of them. One study showed that 90% of them were had none or less than 5% of the 10% of their active Very ingredients nice. yep. in the products. There was a story I, I read. There's um, at least 600 dogs and over 3,600 an- animals that are sick because of supplements from China Oof. that were contaminated. And so they're they're not putting in good quality supplements, mm-hmm. and then they're getting all these uh, things in there that are adding contaminants. And that happened with the pet foods a while ago mm-hmm. from China. So ask your veterinarian which supplement you should be using. Don't pick yeah. something up at Trader Joe's or PetSmart. Um, I find a lot of these that come in and they'll say glucosamine from shellfish or yeah, no. um, chondroitin from uh, chicken. Mm-hmm. You really want the actual products that are supposed <laughs> to be in there. They're just grinding up shellfish and grinding up chicken cartilage. It's not going to do what it needs to do. There's um, several forms of the glucosamine. If you're getting something that has a glucosamine hydrochloride, that's the most easily absorbable, that's the best quality, if it's got it in there. Sometimes they'll put glucosamine hydrochloride on there and they won't find any when they test these things. There's another form of glucosamine called glucosamine potassium chloride, and Hmm. that is very poorly absorbed. Only 4% of it's absorbed into the dog. So it's really cheap. You can get it very cheaply, but if you put it into the supplements and you say, hey, it's got 500 milligrams of glucosamine, but only 20 milligrams are getting into the dog, that's not very useful. No, not at all. With chondroitin, chondroitin is a a chain molecule, and the shorter the chains, the better the absorption. So you can imagine a big chain, which they have a hard time crossing the um, mucosal barrier in the intestinal tract and getting into the bloodstream. But the smaller chains do, and the the good supplements will say short chain chondroitin's in there. Um, fish oil is one of the things I tell people, if you open the bottle and it smells fishy, it's probably not that good. Mm, yeah, yeah. If you put it in a freezer, and this is something somebody told me, and it turns cloudy, it's probably not a good quality one. Oh, so like the actual gel in it? Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. And then I saw this neat little uh, demo they were doing on the internet where you take um, some warm water and put it in a styrofoam cup. And then you empty your fish oil capsule into the styrofoam cup. Huh. And it will, if it's really good fish oil, it actually starts to dissolve the styrofoam. So the styrofoam really? will start to fork little holes and the water will start to leak out. Really? Yeah. Huh. So if you want to take an extra capsule and do that, that's uh, that's one way you can tell if you're getting a good quality. That'd or be again, fun. ask your veterinarian. We've got great quality omega threes here, um, and I think there's less of a, an issue with the quality of omega threes because there's a lot of good sources for that. Yeah. There's just um, the uh, sources for the other supplements can be very expensive. Um, so start with the if you want to start a supplement, start with the brand your veterinarian recommends. Mm-hmm. If you're finding it's too expensive, you want to try something else. See if it's going to work first with a good one. Yeah. And then you can always try something else. A lot of times, what you're going to find is that the they're not going to do as well on that other supplement. No. So it's worth it. And not the the best supplements are not necessarily the most expensive supplements. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a, a 
the company I like, Nutrimax, that makes a Dasquin, they make an over-the-counter one called Cosquin. That was the first yeah. one that they came out with. It's a great that's supplement. Good. The Dasquin's an improved version of it, but if you want something a little less expensive, that's good quality, that's one that you can go for. Well, and then, like, the biggest thing with glucosamine, too, just like with almost any medication, your pets usually aren't going to change as soon as they get it within five minutes. So you do have to give it some time to get into right. the body and do what it needs to do. We have a lot of people that will give them their pet a day on the medication and be like, right. well, my dog won't eat it and try to bring it back or it doesn't work. It will if you give it time. It can take up to six weeks mm -hmm. uh, on the glucosamine supplements. Some people see improvement within a couple of weeks. Yeah. But if you if you don't give it six weeks, you can't really say it's not helping. Mm -hmm. them. Well, then depending on what you're using it for, like if it's hips, knees or something, or if you're trying to give them the medication before a surgery, if surgery is going to improve it, the Joint supplements is going to help it, mm -hmm. but it's not going to completely fix it. Right. So don't expect like a cure in a bag or a bottle. Right. It's going to help though. And the other use that I've seen for glucosamine chondroitin is they've found that it might be helpful in cats that have um, chronic cystitis. Oh, really? So it helps protect the surface of their bladder and protect it from recurring infections. Huh. So, uh, you know, there's other things in the joints that these supplements can be very helpful for, yeah. especially the MSM and the fish oil. Fish oil, I think, has got a lot of uses throughout the body. It yeah. helps with the skin and the immune system, neurologic function. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if your vet says, hey, get them on a fish oil supplement, that's probably a good thing to do. Good. So if you have any questions, ask your vet. They're going to have the best products. Get the stuff that's on their shelves because they've researched it, they've used it, and they know it works. All right. We're going to move on to our pet health news segment, and I got a really cool story here. <laughs> this is from England. Of course, all of these cool stories England. never come from the United <laughs> States. So Alan Spencer is a 67-year-old man, and he has a dog, Lexi. It's an 18-month-old um, Labrador. And he has Lexi to thank for saving his life. <laughs> so Mr. Spencer was sitting at home with his jar of pickled onions. Yum. And one of the pickled onion skins got stuck in his windpipe. And he knew he was choking. And he could, he could feel himself start to get faint. Things were going black. He was trying to make it to the door to get out, and he just collapsed on the floor. Oh, my God. And he just said he felt his life slipping away. And his dog actually started going crazy, and she actually thumped on his back, jumped on his back. Wow. And she was able to force the pickled onion skin out of his windpipe huh. and saved his life. So we should teach dogs to jump on people. We can save your life. It was instinctual for this dog <laughs> to do this. So, huh. you know, it, and I, she okay. should get a medal for this, but she stayed with him because she was really worried. She stayed with him for a few hours afterwards and know, you know, what was going on. But, you know, if it wasn't for that dog, he probably would have died. died. Yeah. So, you know, huh. um, this is a, we're going to talk a little bit more on how dogs can be helpful in your life. This is a little <laughs> bit more direct way. But... Um, I think that's a pretty neat story, and again, you know, if someone finds so many cool stories in America, just let us know yeah. so we can we could tell them here. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is a study by from the American Heart Association News, and this was published in the Circular Circulation, the Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes Journal, and it was out actually out of Sweden. And what they did is they wanted to see how was your risk of death after a heart attack or stroke if you own a dog or if you didn't own a dog. They wanted okay. to see if owning a dog made any difference. And yes. It does. I mean, <laughs> every, everyone knows that people who have dogs mm -hmm. are healthier or happier. They reduce blood pressure. They do all these things. But they actually found a 33% lower risk for heart attacks and 27% lower risk for mortality after strokes. Nice. Now, this is compared to having a partner or a child. Having a spouse or a partner, 15% less. A child, 12% less. So people who uh, who have pets instead of family members, they're actually going to have a better chance of recovery from these things <laughs> that <laughs> than with their family sense. members around. They, they think it might help be explained by um, increased physical activity mm -hmm. and certainly decreased uh, depression and loneliness yeah. because you have the companionship of the animal with none of the judgment that you can get <laughs> from the spouse or child. Um, dog owners experience less social uh, isolation, more yep. interaction with other people mm -hmm. because they're going to dog parks and yep. taking walks. And keeping a dog is good motivation for physical activity, which is an important factor in rehabilitation and mental illness. Yep. And mental illness plays a big role in this as well. Mm -hmm. So they did um, just a general study also comparing um, mortality and other things with do dog owners versus non-dog owners. They saw a 24% decrease in the risk of all causes of mortality in dog owners. Nice. 
a 65% reduce in more re, re, uh, 65% reduction in mortality risk after heart attacks. Wow. So that means you were two thirds less likely to die after a heart attack if you owned a dog. Wow. Okay. 31% reduced mortality risk following cardiovascular related issues. issues. So that could be other heart problems that are going on. <laughs> so if you're having heart problems, you don't have a dog, get a dog. We need to get everybody dogs. In fact, the next step in their study is they're going to do an interventional study where they're going to prescribe dogs for people who have heart disease. That is beautiful. Yes. Yes. So uh, I, I'd like them to do this study with cats, but uh, I have a feeling it may not be as work out as well with them. All right. Um, Veterans Day was last week. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk about this story about a dog named D Doc. D D O C. D Doc. D Doc's a uh, veteran. He's a yes. dog, and he worked with the military in Afghanistan. And um, there was a one day he was on patrol, and mortar fire blew the dog and his handler off their feet. D Doc dragged his handler to safety and stood guard until it was safe for uh, people to come get them. Okay. So um, he had retired. And he's a Belgian Malinois, and he re was retired and in need of a good home. So uh, Sergeant Chloe Wells ended up fostering him and sharing her home with him. And she had another Malinois, a German Shepherd. Um, and she just felt a calling to help this veteran Aww. in need. So she made a commitment to keep him, at least until she could find him a, a better home. But she was going to foster him for, for then. But they lived near uh, a military base. And they found that when the artillery fired off at Fort Bragg in North Carolina, he would jump and frantically run around the table. He would stay alert, shaking. Um, and what she noticed, she was, a, she was a behavioral health therapist at Fort Bragg, oh. that his behavior very much mimicked the behavior she would see in the, the veterans that were coming back with PTSD. So she went to talk with his handler in, in uh, Afghanistan and got more of the history of the, what happened to him there. And realized, hey, you know what? This dog is suffering PTSD. Dogs yeah. can suffer this just like people. Mm -hmm. So she found a veterinarian who accepted this as a diagnosis for him. They worked on getting him some medications, some antidepressants and anti-anxiety medications, and doing some training to help uh, him deal with his anxiety. And he's Aww. starting to make a recovery. He's actually starting a second career as a therapy dog. Aww. So, And she's actually taking him to meet the, sur the soldiers that are suffering from PTSD. Oh, that's good. So um, it looks like they've started a, a foundation called the D-Doc Foundation to help support uh, combat canines that may be suffering from PTSD. Oh, that's so, good. So, yes, we do want to recognize our, our soldiers who mm -hmm. fought in the wars, but they rely a lot on these animals. Oh, yeah. And, you know, D-Doc saved somebody's <laughs> life. He identified 14 IEDs that probably yeah. saved dozens, oh, yeah. not hundreds of lives. Ooh. So these dogs are much a part of our military as, mm -hmm. the, as the humans. So congratulations to D-Doc and, and support them if you, if you feel moved to do that. Yeah. Okay. Case of the week. This is always fun. <laughs> All right, this one actually ties into a little bit to our, our subject on the joint supplements because this was a case that was referred to me by one of the other veterinarians in the practice because he felt, hey, you know, this dog probably needs joint surgery. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about the owners didn't have a lot of money doing a what's called a femoral head osteotomy. We were actually cut off the femoral head, okay. the ball part of the ball and socket joint in the hip. And uh, so I said, well, let me look into the history a little bit more and find out what's going on. And I asked the owner, have, have you tried joint supplements? He said, yes, we tried joint supplements. It didn't do a thing. I said, well, which joint supplement did you try? And she said, well, something I got from Trader Joe's, which is a local ah, chain okay. out here. So I said, give me a picture of the label, bring it in, and let me take a look at it. And sure enough, it did not have good quality <laughs> glucosamine chondroitin at all. I bet the dog was not getting any glucosamine chondroitin. Um, so we said, hey, listen, this is a permanent uh, thing. If we're going to do mm -hmm. the surgery, let's try this for a couple months, see if we get any better response. And he had really bad hip dysplasia. He would, um, he would, his hips, I could just feel them pop in and out just Ooh. as I was moving them uh, just to extend them or abduct them. So it was really obvious that he was having some comfort. He could, he could walk. He could, he's slow getting up, a little bit of trouble. So we're going to reevaluate him in about six weeks and see how things are going and take it from there. Nice. So um, basically this is just illustrates the importance of not self-diagnosing and treating your yeah. dog with the supplements. Get something that mm -hmm. you know. Because uh, and talk to your vet and say, you know, maybe we can avoid doing this procedure if we try something like that. Yeah. And this is a young dog. He's only nine months old. So mm -hmm. before we go and do something that's going to affect the rest of his life, we want to see if we can make that yeah. better without it. That would be something where he's on his like, desk and probably for life then. Yeah. 
he'll be on on that, and he's in good shape. He's not overweight. If he exercises and everything, I think he'll probably be able to do well. He may need some pain medication later in life. Um, there's another procedure that we'll sometimes do in these dogs. And these people don't have a lot of money, so this wasn't an option. It's called a triple pelvic osteotomy, mm. where they actually cut the pelvis in three places and rotate it to better cover the acetabulum, yeah. uh, cover the femoral head, so it doesn't pop in and out like that. And you have to have relatively good joints to begin with, and mm-hmm. so usually those are dogs less than a year of age that have that procedure. Okay. And, you know, other people might end up going for a hip replacement, which is another option. Yeah. But let's try the, the easy things that get at the source of the pain first and see how it does. Yeah. All right, here's something that uh, I wanted to talk about this week, and because it, it comes up all the time. Mm-hmm. How am I going to get this medication in the pet? Because I'll go into the room, and I'll have a cat, and I'll say, here, you put the pill in the back of the throat, rub here, and then they lick their nose, and they get it, and they go, he's not going to do that for me, Doc. So I wanted to <laughs> kind of go over what are some options we have for pilling pets, mm-hmm. and what are things people can ask their vets for if there's just absolutely no way they're going to get a pill, yeah. pill into their pet. Well, most people don't think about it when you get a puppy or a kitten that giving them medication at some point in their life is going to be a thing. A lot of times, pills are some of the biggest and first options. Um, they do come in chewables. Yeah, a lot um, of medications do. A lot of medication nowadays do. Probably back in the day, older owners probably only had pills as an option. Right. But chewables are a thing. There are liquids now. Um, or there are even injectables. Um, Long-acting if, injectables. Mm-hmm, yeah. That are an option. Um, pilling, though, is one of the hardest ones for most owners. Um, especially for cats. <laughs> See, now I find pilling cats really easy. <laughs> I um, find that that's the one I get asked about most for. How am I going to pill my cat? Um, and usually with cats, we do something called a kitty burrito. And it's where you have to take a blanket and you pretty much, you know, a mother out there would know, you swaddle your cat. And you just wrap up everything, especially if they do have those claws, so that they're not scratching you, that they're not kicking you. And you have them right. kind of, you know, wrapped up safely in place. They're snug and where their head's poking out. And you just want to kind of grab the back of their, uh, kind of the joint of their yeah, jaw. Yeah, right behind the upper canine teeth on their upper jaw. Yeah. yeah and you can lift their, their jaw open. Mm-hmm. Right? And you just want to kind of take the pill and just drop it as far back in the back of the yes. throat as you can. Every now and then, you may just have to take a finger and just into yes. the mouth. Well, what I tell people is make sure you're pulling the head back and it's extending fine. the mm-hmm. neck because that loosens the jaw. Yeah. And a lot of people are just trying to, you know, with the head straight forward, trying to push them, pull the mouth open that way. You don't, you'll never Mm-mm. be able to do it. You'll never do it and you're going like to get if, bit. If you try and keep your mouth closed and tilt your head all the way back, you can't do it. Your, your mouth just opens. So just lean your head up back. See, you're leaning your whole body back. You can't just lean your oh, head Oh, just back. the head? Oh. You'll feel it start to go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yes, we just did that. We tried it. Try, try and see if you can do it at home. Um, but, yeah, that's one of the things, you know, getting the head back right. as far back as possible. Um, and then if you're, if you're concerned about getting your fingers in the mouth, um, you could ask your veterinarian for something called a pill wand. Yes. Um, those are something those are that we use daily here. Um, there's this cool little rubber top where you can get your pill in there, and mm-hmm. it holds it snugly. And then there's this little application in the back like a syringe where it just – pushes the syringe on and it just yeah. shoots out and it's really cool your and fingers are nowhere near their teeth no and it's like a good like maybe i don't know ruler so about a 10 12 inches long inches, yeah. yeah and so your hand is really nowhere near the mouth yeah um it works for dogs it works for cats i think we even had to do it with like a iguana before wow um yeah so like killing an iguana <laughs> yeah that was fun it's not really. Um, <laughs> but those things really come in handy, um, especially for pills. Or, you know, if you have very food-motivated animals, pill pockets work beautifully. Yes. Or just yes. any soft treats. Yeah, the lean treats that we have are like Play-Doh. You mm-hmm. can put pills in there and yes. also We hide treats in those all the time. We use yeah. them a lot for our boarding animals when they're here. Or and that's a good reason to get those treats and give them to them just as treats without mm-hmm. the medicine in them. Yeah, because then they don't notice something's up yeah. with it. Um, and it's great too because those are kind of easier on the stomach than giving them a spoonful of peanut butter or cheese or things like right. that. Less likely to cause stomach upsets. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they're good for hiding the medications in there. Um, or if just pills are not happening if your pet is finicky or things like that, liquids. We do have liquids. Um, some come in liquids, some we can have formulated. So yeah. we can actually have the pharmacy make it up in any flavor that we want. Mm-hmm. Liver. Yep. Chicken tuna. We no, had to do I marshmallow for a rabbit. There we go. That was fun. 
and it was really sweet. We actually wanted to taste it. It's, it's a little extra charge, but if it gets the medication into the animal and we mm-hmm. don't have an injectable alternative, that's the way to go. Yep, it does good for them. Um, or the last one, usually the best one, especially for, again, cats, injectables. Um, yeah. Usually, especially antibiotics, we have a long-acting one that sits for right. two weeks. Um, unfortunately, pain medication, I don't think we have a really good long-acting pain medication not yet we talked about that that's coming out it's the coming out he's coming out the, yeah the nerve growth factor on anybody mm-hmm. so. but for right now we have just you know ones that last for 24 hours which yeah. for more cats uh, for most cats 24 hours of pain relief is better than nothing right. we've even had some owners that come in daily um for the pain injection because that's easier for the cat and they feel better yeah um but you know Usually pilling is the easier way to go yeah. for some animals, especially if you have well, food-motivated pets. There, there's one other thing that we'll some, we use for some medications, and that's transdermal. Trans, yes. Or, and this is for cats primarily, where they'll make it mm-hmm. in a form that uses gel, where it actually absorbs through their skin. Yeah. yeah. It comes with a little applicator pen, and you dial out the medicine and rub it on your ear. Careful not to rub it on your skin, because mm-hmm. it'll absorb through your skin. Mm-hmm. It doesn't work for every cat, because not every cat absorbs every medication in this form. Yeah. Um, but for some, especially for hyperthyroid cats, that was what it was first oh, yeah, used for. It makes a huge mm-hmm. difference on that. I say we see it sometimes for uh, phylloxetine cats too. Yeah. Um, that are anxious and you know won't eat the pill or I've can't seen it for, get it for blood pressure medications mm-hmm. for cats. Because um, cats are probably they are the worst to do. <laughs> um, and you know you don't want to push the pill in the wrong airway, have mm-hmm. them get st- or have them get stuck in their throat. Sometimes it helps uh, with cats to coat the pill with something like a little bit of butter yeah. or a little bit of hairball medicine, something slippery, so it slides right down their throat real easily. Or yeah. make sure that you give them a little bit of water afterwards so it's not sitting in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but there's some dogs that people come and say, yeah, I try peanut butter, and they, they find yeah, yeah. it no matter what, and they spit it out. And mm-hmm. they, put, they put it in a big thing, a bowl, and they'll eat all around it, and you just see little capsules Just a capsule, there. yeah. So these are some really good tips. And um, yeah, yeah, ask your vet. Ask yeah. your vet tech. Mm-hmm. They're going to have some great <laughs> tips on how to do this. Ask them to demonstrate how to give the pill yeah. in the room before you leave mm-hmm. so you can see what they're doing. Yeah. And if you are not sure when you get home, come back again and say, can you show me again? Yeah. We're not going to think you're stupid. We're, no. We want that medicine to get in the pets. It doesn't work sitting yeah. in the body. Well, and I always tell people, too, if you're going to have other people in the house help you, bring them so we can show them how to do it, too. Yeah. I don't want you teaching someone and someone get bit or right. get hit if the dog head butts them or somebody or cat scratches them. We mm-hmm. don't want anyone getting hurt trying to medicate their pet. Bring them in. We yes. do not mind teaching you guys the tr- traits of it. And for those of you who have the dogs that just let you shove the pills down their throat, you don't even have to listen to this. You guys are lucky. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, next week we're going to um, start talking about another uh, common problem that we see in cats and dogs, diabetes. Yes. Okay? There are two different diseases in cats and dogs. Um, cats present with type um, 2, dogs usually present with type 1. Mm-hmm. They're very similar to the diabetes in people, so we're going to talk about diagnosing, treating, managing these animals. Yep. So I uh, hope you'll tune in for that. Even if you don't have a diabetic animal, t- teach you what to look for, how to mm-hmm. prevent it from happening. Yeah. So. That's it for this week. I'm Dr. Jim Hosek. I'm Brittany. We'll see you.